Praise the Lord. I want to read one scripture verse before we go into the acronym of unity today. And the verse is in Galatians 3. We read it last Sunday. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. No question about it. We did the little demonstration on the stage last Sunday. Five different communities represented in five different communities, five different ethnic groups, looking at all the differences between them, but they were able to hold hands at the end of the questions because we are one in Christ. If ever there was a more profound truth and evidence of unity, it would be the fact that we are one. We showed you how that if we're of Abraham's seed, and Abraham was of the seed of Adam, then we are all relatives. Hello, aunt, uncle, cousin, from whatever. We are all relatives. We all come from the seed of Adam. I want to talk today about the word, for the word unity, the letter U for unleashed. Jesus unleashed his power in us when we became believers and when he filled us with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The word unleashed is a uh, interesting word. Different meanings and different applications. With all of its meanings and applications, I want to draw our attention to what I believe this word means to us when it comes to unity. When Jesus said he unleashed his power, what was he talking about? The word power there in the Greek is dunamis. It's where we get our Greek word for dynamite. Dunamis, dino, dynamite. God has made us with great potential. God has given us great power with this potential. But built within this power that God gave us, as you recall, when we gave our hearts to the Lord, remember we said last week, he literally dumped into us and parted into us the fruit of the Spirit. He imparted into us all these abilities to do and to be someone that we may not have been prior to that or not had had his fruit in us prior to it. We might have understood the word love. We might have understood the word how to be kind. We might have understood the word patience just as a normal person in life. But when he saved us and he poured that fruit into us, he gave us ability to be able to manifest those fruit so that we could grow in the Lord, John 15, so that we could bear fruit, more fruit, and then he said much fruit in John 15. It was for the purpose of knowing him and to know his father better. It was for the purpose of understanding what love is and what strength and peace and joy that we can have within that we didn't know about before we became a believer. It was never, ever, ever given to us. And I'm going to be very delicate here for a moment today. But this power, this love, these fruit, this ability that he gave us upon our salvation and being filled with the Spirit was never for the purpose of having what I call a privatized lifestyle of Christianity, but rather a lifestyle that would be very open, a lifestyle that would be very busy, a lifestyle that would be very obvious, that would work with others to make the unity and to bring about the unity of the task in which God has called us to. It does matter today that we are believers. It is important to have a personal relationship with God, but God never intended it that it would be a private thing. He never meant for us to be just off to ourselves, having our own private little walk with God. 
Does he want us to have a nice walk with him? Yes. But he never intended that it would be just for us, just for me, just for me personally, and forget everybody else. He really intended that the love and the joy and the peace and the strength and, and the forbearance and the kindness and patience and joy and peace that he gave us for our own development, it was for the purpose of others. As we read in John 17, 22 and 23 last week, he made that very clear that I and the Father are one and we want the world to know through their message that we are one and that they are one. That we make a difference together. When Jesus said, Father, you and I are one, they were making a difference together. We make a difference when we're together. We make a difference. Potential and power has been unleashed in us as salvation at the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that we have greater ability to go about and accomplish and do what God wants us to do. It never was meant to be for our own private use. But also, say also, but also for the use of others. By doing that, we've become nurtured. We've become nurtured. This unity doesn't happen automatically. Remember I said last week that when we become a believer, while he pours his fruit in us, he pours his spirit, he gives us his power, everything we've just been saying, and so much more that we have time to describe. The one thing that he doesn't pour into us is unity, yet he pours within us the ability to have unity. Unity is a working word. <laughs> it is an active word. Unity is something we produce. Unity is something that we create, that we make happen. We make that happen. The ideal of being nurtured is a twofold nurturing here. There is my nurturing for my own well being, there is my nurturing for my own personal care. I want to know God, I want to understand His Word. That's why. I read the Bible every day. I want to understand his word. I want to know him. I want to know him better. That's a personal thing. And I want that personal walk with the Lord because I'm no good to anybody. If I don't have a good personal relationship with God, I'm not. But then there is a reason for this as well in order that I might nurture, that I might care, that I might protect, that I might help, that I might feed, that I might, I might develop others. Example, you take the birth of a child. When our little ones came into our family, you know, all eyes, all attention was on helping them, nurturing them, changing their diapers, feeding them, holding them. I got in trouble one time when little uh, Rylan was born. It was the middle of the night. And she was exhausted, so we slipped off to the living room. One thing my wife would not do, she would not bother me Saturday night. She said, "Hun, you need your rest for Sunday. But during the week, I need your help. So it was one of those nights that wasn't going to be Sunday. Well, I'm supposed to watch a little Rylan. I lay him on my chest. He's not in this big. And I fell asleep. Thank God he did too. She came out in the morning, saw us, and boy, did I hear about that one. You never fall asleep with a little one on your chest. But it was so cute, and he was so relaxed, and I just dozed right off. So just thank God he was there. But you know what? That was such a bonding experience to be able to hold your child. Well, folks, this, this is what happens spiritually. This, this is the kind of nurturing and developing and feeding and sharing that we do for others. He said, we, we bring him into our care. We, we, we spiritually hug each other. We spiritually care. We spiritually protect each other. We are spiritually there for each other to encourage, to help, to strengthen, to nurture, to do what we can to help one another. And, there, and it, it, it isn't to be a pick and choose. It's to be that everyone matters for that. Everyone matters when it comes to that. We just do it because we do it. We just do it. We practice the, the, the 59 one another's in the New Testament. There's 59. Now, some of those 59 are repeated. Several times are repeated. Or there's the each other's. So if you combine the each other's and the, the one another's, 
And some of them are repeated. There's, it told us to be 59 in the New Testament. That's a lot of responsibility. Love one another. Pray for one another. You, you get the point? Look at all the one another's. As you read in the New Testament, read all the one another's and all the each other's. It's, it's there. And, and we do this because we're being unified. And we are unified when we do it. So to the extent that I spend with God, to the extent that I, time I spend with God, communing and relating and sharing and absorbing and basking in him, meditating on him, is the extent that I grow in the Lord and my own personal nurturing, but at the same time I grow in the Lord with the ability to walk alongside you in unity to share, to commune, to relate, to encourage, to help, and to care for you. And when we do that with each other because of the one another's, when we do that with each other, we build a strong unity. We build a strong body. We build a strong unit that can work together. And when the world sees that, boy, do they see Jesus. Which brings us to the word inclusive. I think this is an area today that really needs a lot of attention. It needs a lot of attention. I know what we just said. I'm laying the foundation and the staging for that. But folks, we really need to learn to practice it. We really need to learn to practice it. There's neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ in that respect. Let me just read something to you here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone, I'm, I'm going to drive you crazy. Say everyone. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All, say all. All the believers were together and had everything. Say everything. Everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone. Say anyone. Who had need. Every day, say every. Every day they continued to meet together. Say together. <laughs> in the temple courts, they broke bread in their home. Say there. Yes. And ate together. Say together. Yes. With glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all Lord. the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Do you see any privatizing here? Do you see any private work here? Do you see being off on your own little journey? Do you see yourself just all about you? Or all about me? It's, there's nothing related to that. And, and that, you know, in this passage of scripture, I, I was going to bring to the platform, but I, I decided not to do that. Um, but there, there, there was 28 translations on this verse that we just read, that they ate together, and they were one, this passage, 28 different translations. And they all were saying the same thing, obviously. The folks, I just had to check it out. Let me tell you something. These people, if they had wealth, they gave it up. If they had extra property, they sold it and gave it to the, uh, the work of the Lord. That's, we're the opposite in our culture today. In our culture today, it's how much can I have? It's how much can I get? It's how much can I enjoy? That doesn't mean that everybody who has doesn't give. In fact, one reason why some people have is because they are such givers. They're so blessed in return. But the point is, in, in, in these days, they made sure that everyone was taken care of. I, this is why you are such a beautiful, beautiful church. This is why you're such a blessed church. When I go back to thinking about Hope Day and I saw how many people were there from the church. You know what I told You're going to kill me. I'm going to have to get my car started here. I can exit real quick. But you know what I told the gentleman from Hope, uh, Convoy of Hope? I said, I got to tell you what, brother. He said, you know, we've been trying to get into Wilmington. I says, he said, I couldn't get, I couldn't get a pastor to do that. I said, I'll tell you what. I guarantee you, you get a pastor to do that, we'll get carloads of people going up there. Because, oh good, I don't have to start my car. But, 
I said, I guarantee you I could get carloads of people that would travel to Wilmington for a day to do that. Because that's the kind of DNA you folks have here. That's the kind of heart you folks have here. And I'm telling you, God's rewarding you for that. But it, it, you're, you're practicing. You're practicing what they did. And, and listen, the, the, the ideal is, is of this inclusive thing. Lots of applications to this word. But here's one definition of the word inclusion. It means a group that's particularly welcoming to all kinds of people. Quote it again, right out of the dictionary. A group that's particularly welcoming to all kinds of people. I guess in the dictionary we could have put the word, it's Calvary, Assembly of God, welcoming all kinds of people. Because that's exactly who you are. That's exactly what you have done. You have made everyone feel welcomed here at Calvary. That's how important it is that when we see each other in the morning that we smile. And remember I said last Sunday, if you put your nose in the air, you hope you don't leave it up there because if it rains, you'll drown. It's just, it's nice that we can be eye level with each other. It's nice that we can look each other in the eyes and we can say hi to each other. We can shake each other's hands. Or we can do the bump five or whatever it is we need to do. But it's nice that we learn to do that, to be kind and, and friendly to one another. That's being inclusive. Everybody matters. Everybody matters. That was a, we used that theme over the years at Calvary. Bringing in the ideal of having his power within us, being nurtured and nurturing others, we now see the power of the impact unity has as a group of people working together. Remember what it said last week in Ephesians 4, 16? Here's what it said. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Folks, that is the picture of unity. That's being inclusive. He's unleashed his power. He's nurtured us. So that we don't just take in, but we give out to nurture others. So that the others can feel included. That's unity. We have the power to have unity. We grow in the Lord. We grow each other. We produce unity. The fullness of the statute of Christ. As we read in Acts 2. No one's telling you to go out today and sell all your properties and sell all your boats and lands and all that, saying that. I'm saying to you that's what they did in Bible days. They made sure they took care of each other. Now, if God speaks to you and you need to sell a piece of land, you need to sell a boat and do something like that, you, you obey the Lord. But that's not what we're, we're saying today. We're just telling you what they did in the early church to take care of each other. They made sure that that was number one. That word common meant they made sure that what was have you ever heard the phrase, what is mine is yours and what is yours is mine too? You ever hear that phrase? Somebody try to trick you? Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, no, what is mine is yours and, and what is yours is mine. I want you to know when, when we met Sean, my daughter's husband, when we, when we met for the first time, he, he had been scared to death. He was scared to death to meet us. Scared to death, my daughter said. And we had not met him yet. She brought him home for the first time. He was in the Air Force. I haven't forgiven him for that, for taking her away from us. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> he, he, he's currently, uh, 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 he's an OSI agent, and he's currently uh, driving around a, uh, in the bodyguard for a, a, a top general in, in the Air Force at this time. It's his special assignment right now. And, uh, but when he walked in the front door, I said, hi, how are you? Introduced myself. I said, the refrigerator's in that room right over there. He was stunned. He, told me, he, was, he was shocked. He, he, he just didn't expect that. He thought for sure there might be some, some kind of quiz going on here. Hey, buddy, the refrigerator is right in that room right over there. You're from the Air Force. I know you're hungry. I know you've got to be hungry. But anyways, uh, inclusive, received, one, together, no questions asked. We accept each other. No questions asked. If after we accept somebody and we learn who that person might be, now God can use us. 
to help that person. We don't want to judge first and do nothing. We want to accept first and have opportunity. Did that make sense? Do I need to say that again? Okay, I will. We don't judge first, then get to know a person. We accept a person first, and then we get to help them if they need help. That's how we do that. Then we're together. We're together. Now, I'm going to say something sensitive again. I do not theologically agree. There is not a piece of theology in the Bible that you will ever be able to show me. Bring your Bible, make an appointment, come to my office. Well, it's not my office anymore. Come to Ryan's office. (laughs) Come to Pastor Ryan's office. I'll meet you there. And we're going to sit down and have a hard time. I want you to show me in the Bible that says, and I know I'm saying this to the people who are here today, but you know people who aren't here today because they have this view. Yeah, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I want you to show me where that verse is in the Bible. Not only do I want you to show me that verse, I want you to show me that teaching is in the Bible. I want you to show me. In print, where I don't have to be in church. I want you to show me that. And if you can prove to me from Scripture, I will be glad to stand in the pulpit and recant my feelings. But I'm telling you, you're not going to find a Scripture that says you don't have to be in church. Because the Bible talks about just the opposite. Forsake not the assembling together of the saints. And all the more, Hebrews 10 says, as the day approaches. So we should be gathering someplace more than ever, according to Scripture, be it we gather as a church in a home, a small group, a church building. This ideal of privatizing our lives so much that we don't need to be with others is not a biblical teaching. It's not biblical. It's not wrong to have a long time with God. But it is wrong not to be together. It's wrong. It's biblically wrong. Because the Bible teaches 59 one another's. The Bible teaches the opposite. For all, this, for all this to work, we need to be together. We need to be together physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. Luke 2, 52 says, Jesus grew in stature and in wisdom and in favor with God and man. That means he grew mentally, he grew physically, socially, and spiritually. And all four forms of growth Jesus had are the same four we're to have. So we are to be together. We are to come together. To not come together to church and or in small groups and or that we get together is to violate the purpose of unity. It's to violate the purpose of unity. We, again, we cannot prove from Scripture that we're not to be together. So, one day, this man was marooned on an island for years. And finally, a ship came along. And the captain, as he walked ashore to meet the man, to come pick him up, finally, he said to the man, he said, I noticed you've got three huts here. And the man said, yeah, yep. But you're the only one here. I said, yep. He said, yeah, that first hut over there, that's, that's where I live. Okay. And that hut over there, well, that's where I, I go to church. And the captain said, well, what's, what's the third hut for? Oh, that's where I used to go to church. Every time I hear that, I laugh. (laughs) Listen, do do you know why so many times people don't like others? It's pretty bad when you can't get alone along with yourself and the only person in the church. That's pretty bad. And the reason why many times people don't like others, folks, is is for this reason. And I'm going to be very straight with you. It's deep. I don't have time to go into it. I've been under assignment to have only two weeks. So I can't develop this more. Talk to the boss about that. I'm just kidding. It's because they don't like themselves. They're not happy with themselves. I don't know who coined the phrase, misery loves company. 
But people who are miserable, who does do loves company, are people. And do, do you know why miserable people make people miserable? They make people miserable. That's why misery loves company, so that they can hopefully make you more miserable, so they can be one up on you. <laughs> That's a person that doesn't like themselves. Well, I'm going to tell you something today. Jesus likes you. We like you. And we would like to know you. We would like to get to know you. We would like to have you come out and get to know us because we do like you. We do love you. There's not a person in this room that we don't but love. Whether I know you really well or I don't know you really well, I love you equally. Always do. If you get mad at me and you told me you're mad at me, I still love you. If you're angry with me and you're still angry with me, I still love you. If I've hurt your feelings, I still love you. didn't mean to. If you hurt my feelings, I still love you. I still love you. I still like you. Because if we're believers, we are one. And so what we do is we learn what Proverbs 27, 17 says. When Proverbs 27, excuse me, 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Look at Jesus and the disciples. <laughs> he had his hands full. He had, a, he had a, a few choice words for them, didn't he? But he loved them. What was he doing? He was sharpening them. He was molding them. He's cleaning them up. Let him get real with us so that we can get real with others. To the extent I let Jesus get real and help me, to the extent I can get to know you better. It may hurt. It may get very hot. It may get very dirty sometimes. But if we follow biblical principles, it will get better. Because the Bible works when we put the Bible to work. But it does require work on both sides. It does require work on both sides. It, 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 it can't be one-sided. It's got to be together, folks. It's got to be together, folks. We've got to do it together. So if we're going to have unity, let's let them unleash the power within us. Let's become nurtured so I can nurture you. Let's do this thing together and not apart from each other, not privatized, but we're together. And let's be accepting of each other across the board. Across the board, let's be accepting of each other. First, Accept it. First, accept. And then, let's be a genuine you. <laughs> let, let, let's, let's not be so difficult that we couldn't even attend our own church because of me. Let's not be that way. Let's include others in our lives. Let's make sure that we are where God wants us to be so I can help you be where God wants you to be. That's called unity and everyone said amen. amen god bless you lord thank you for this beautiful day let us learn and remember and just put to practice and as we leave today as we connect with folks let's make sure there's a smile on our face and we're connecting with our eyes with our our attitudes and lord that we just are accepting and loving each other as we are right now because if there's all those changes to be made, you know how to make those changes. And you use people. And you will use people. You will use people to help change us, to be who you want us to be. So thank you for that, Father, we pray today. Bring us closer together than we've ever been. And we give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor. And all God's people prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. God bless you.